Let's say it out loud. Deficits are a good thing. Truly. So say it. Deficits are good. Deficits are a good thing. Deficits are a good thing. Deficits. Remember how scary that word used to be? One year ago it was. 2015. Here in Ottawa it was a harsh, harsh winter. Sort of reflected the psychic space after nine years of Stephen Harper's government. And there was the drumbeat of the slow march to last fall's federal election. The Conservatives had been hammering away for the last three years about the imperative of eliminating the deficit. They were insistent it was responsible fiscal management. And who doesn't want to be responsible? Responsible must be a magic word for Canadians. The sweet spot of all that focus group testing. Even Justin Trudeau uses it. Develop the tar sands? Why, of course, but it has to be responsible development. Deficits? Yes, but responsible deficits, modest and sustainable. That's what he said during last year's election campaign, and he even put a number on it. A limit of a $10 billion deficit, and only for the first two years. My, how quickly the world has changed. Finance Minister Bill Morneau last Monday held a town hall where he announced that because of the worsening economy, both in Canada and outside, the starting point for the 2016 deficit has now ballooned to $18 billion. And this is before any of the Liberal election promises are factored in. The Conservatives, now in opposition, immediately demanded that the government scale back its spending plans because, according to opposition leader Rona Ambrose, when times are tough in the economy, the government shouldn't spend money. Hmm. Exactly the opposite of what I thought we had learned from the 1930s and the Great Depression. When the economy is sluggish or in a tailspin, government restraint can only add to and even compound the misery. Of course, the experience in Canada is that deficits can be a problem. Back in the mid-1990s, about 20 years ago, we had a mounting national debt and the bond market was making noises about demanding higher interest rates or even refusing to hold Canada's bonds. It's a situation we don't want to repeat, but we're not in that situation today. Thanks to 20 years of pain and effort by Canadians, Canada's net debt to GDP is now the lowest of all countries in the G7. We're now in a situation where we can borrow money at very low interest rates and use it for very good purposes. So last Monday, Bill Morneau announces an $18 billion deficit as the starting point for 2016. And this includes a $6 billion contingency. Another issue for the opposition. Imagine the Conservatives criticizing the Liberals for being too prudent. So with the $10 billion limit on the deficit out of the way, what about those two other promises that the Liberals made during the election campaign? One, that the debt share of the economy would continue to decline over their government, and that by the end of their mandate, the budget would be in balance. There would be zero deficit. And only two months ago, in December, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said these two promises were absolutely cast in stone. Why do politicians even make these promises? And why do we insist on holding them to it? Maybe it's the fault of the media and the opposition. Why can't we be a little more flexible about these things? It's not the first time a government's been caught between election promises and changing economic circumstances. Maybe all this brouhaha about the deficit being broken is just gotcha politics. On the other hand, it is up to the government to be 
upfront and transparent about what it's doing, what it's planning to do, and where it's planning to go. And that's former Finance Deputy Minister Scott Clark said just that in an op-ed piece published in the Globe and Mail. According to Clark, financial markets will accept much bigger deficits as long as Ottawa has a believable story to explain them. I think the favorite word nowadays is narrative. There has to be a believable narrative attached to the budget, showing that the government has a good grip about what's going on in the wider world economy and has a clear path about how it intends to navigate all the uncertainty and risk. To show it's serious, Scott Clark recommends that the federal government commit to holding the debt-to-GDP ratio at 30 percent. I wonder if this is just a finance mandarin getting a little concerned with the spending tendencies of an elected government and wanting to impose some discipline. 30 percent may be a good figure. It may have to go higher, perhaps up to 40 percent, if we want to have a significant enough jolt to really move the economy forward. At midweek, Finance Minister Bill Morneau flies off to China for a meeting of the G20, where he gets to sit around the table with the big boys, the Chinese, the U.S., the Europeans, the Brits. The talk there is that the only thing left for governments is to start spending. Global capitalism is in crisis. The private sector is not investing, and financial markets are very worried. This is far bigger than just Canada, folks. Back home in Canada, meanwhile, the fun continues. There's more discussion about the deficit forecast for 2016. If we start with Bill Morneau's starting point of an $18 billion deficit, and then add in the $10 billion that the Liberals promised in new spending, that brings us up to $28 billion. And at $28 billion, why not round it up to $30 billion? Good starting point. Then the chief economist at one of the banks, the major banks, hardly a risk-taking institution, puts an op-ed piece in the Globe saying that we need more stimulus spending. Ten billion's not enough. On top of Bill Morneau's $18 billion starting point, add in another $20 billion. So you add the $20 billion and the $20 billion, $40 billion. Yes! Way to go, Scotiabank. $40 billion. Of course, we're not all on the same page about this. The Globe and Mail's Jeffrey Simpson, the dean of Ottawa's opinion columnist, reminds us glumly that deficits in the past have gotten Canadians into trouble. And he's right. But haven't we learned anything? In the letters to the editor section, the Globe and Mail publishes only two letters about the budget deficit. One is in favor of the deficit, and one is against. The one against says we should add up all private sector debt, all household debt, and all government debt in Canada, and it comes up to almost three times the size of the economy. And what, he asks, are we going to leave future generations? That was Ronald Reagan's favorite question, too. Remember Ronald Reagan? In the presidential election of 1980, Reagan mercilessly criticized the president at the time, Jimmy Carter, for running a $60 billion deficit. So Reagan wins the election, gets into office, cuts taxes, ramps up spending, and blows the deficit up to over $200 billion, and continues to spend massively with huge deficits for the next eight years. And he was a conservative? And yet he's regarded nowadays as some sort of saint to the right wing. Speaking of conservatives, of course, we have them here in Canada. Out of the West comes Preston Manning with an op-ed piece published in Friday's Globe and Mail. Looking back to the 1993 federal election, the election that swept Preston Manning into Ottawa as the head of the Reform Party, he reprises one of the favorite applause lines he had during that election, criticizing a infrastructure spending promise of Jean Chrétien. 
seems that infrastructure spending is a common theme in Canadian politics. Well, Manning criticized Chrétien's plan, saying it was like trying to start a 747 with a flashlight battery. What a wonderful analogy. And he's right. We need far more than a flashlight battery to start our economy. We need major spending. Next week, I'm going to take a look at what infrastructure spending could mean for Canadians in 2016. And it means a lot more than bridges and roads. Thanks for watching. I'm Andrew Hall.